Right, thank, thank you, Francesco, for that uh, gracious introduction. And uh, thank you all uh, for being here uh, for my very first public talk. And it's almost a full house, so no pressure. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great honor and privilege uh, to be here at uh, NYU AD and uh, to give this talk in my hometown in front of many friends and family. Um, this talk has been a long time coming, and uh, I'm sure there will be many more to come. So I'm going to tell you about uh, quantum mechanics and the nature of space-time. And it's going to be a story about um, two, of the mo two of the major theories of the 20th century, quantum mechanics and uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity, which describes space-time, and how these different theories uh, come together, or rather how we are trying to put them together. Now, putting different things together brings to mind this um, uh, piece by Kandinsky. And it's a great example of how putting together two different things uh, gives you something which is more than the sum of its parts. To begin, let me start very basic and uh, talk about what do physicists do all day? Um, so physics uh, sort of broadly uh, can be categorized into two categories, experimental physics and theoretical physics. In experimental physics, what you do is you observe the universe. You use, you use your telescopes or magnifying glasses, um, and you devise very ingenious experiments so as to isolate a specific physical phenomenon that you're trying to study from the environment. And it's really crazy what, exper what experimentalists can do. I'll give you an example later in the talk. I am not an experimental physicist. I'm a theoretical physicist. What that means is what I do most of the day is think. Um, neither can I. <laughs> um, um, uh, and the, thing, the things that we think about is we, we take the observations done by the experimental physicists, and we try to make sense out of them. Um, the, it, physicists have um, sort of found out uh, a few hundred years ago that the universe has a language. And the language of the universe is not English or Arabic. It's mathematics. And the thing that the task of a theoretical physicist is to find mathematical theories or models that describe the observations uh, from the experimentalists. And so the process of science, or rather the cycle of science, is a back and forth between experiment and theory. Uh, you take an observation from experiment, and you try to explain it using theory. Sometimes theory gives you a prediction, and you try to check for that in experiment. Uh, the goal, at least for a theoretical physicist, is to find the unifying theory of everything that describes all possible physical phenomena. This lecture will be about surprises in combining different ideas together, and in particular, uh, combining quantum mechanics and space-time. Let me begin with space-time. So the beginnings of our modern understanding of space and time actually can be traced back to the 1800s. Many physicists were intrigued by two phenomena, electricity and magnetism. This is just static electricity. Um, and um, many experiments at the time, pioneered by Michael Faraday, um, in, involving wires and batteries and magnets, suggested that these two concepts are related somehow. But the question was, can you unify them consistently? Unification came at the hands of James Maxwell, this dashing man with this amazing beard. Um, um, who wrote down these equations, um, part of which were actually written down before him, but he's the one who completed them and, and, and gave a consistent set of mathematical equations, now um, named in his honor. And you don't need to understand what goes on here. I can explain it in words. I can explain the important part of these equations in words, which is that it says that if you have an electric field, that produces a magnetic field. But that magnetic field produces an electric field. But then that electric field produces a magnetic field, and so on, and so on, and so on. Sometime, sort of during the end of his days, 
they understood that this described light. That light is actually an electromagnetic wave. It is a pair of oscillating electric and magnetic fields um, propagating in space. Um, another result from this unification of electricity and magnetism is that light actually has a finite speed. Um, you might be wondering, but when I turn on the, light, the, 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 sort of the light switch, light just is everywhere. It almost seems instantaneous. But that's just because light is really, really, really fast. It takes uh, roughly eight minutes for light to get to us from the sun, for example. If the sun was to disappear right now, you would not know it except eight minutes into the future. Another um, surprising result from this theory or the set of equations, um, something which was uh, not expected at all is that the speed of light is the same for any person moving at constant speed. I, maybe you didn't really understand what that means, um, but that's okay. It's an important point though. But uh, it actually took an Einstein to figure out uh, the importance of this statement. Um, and so he was like, hmm, wait a second. Um, he considered the following um, sort of hypothetical situation. Um, he said, let me consider two observers, an Alice who is just standing and a, a Bob that is inside a truck. And inside this truck, Bob has a flashlight or a light bulb and a screen on the ceiling of the truck. Einstein said, let me consider, this tr let me consider a moving truck um, where at some point the light, uh, Bob turns on the light and, and then which emits some light and which propagates upwards and makes a flash on the, on the screen on the ceiling. Now, from Bob's perspective, light just went straight up. It covered a distance, D1, let's say. Um, from Alice's perspective, light did not go straight up, but in, but in fact went in a diagonal direction, and it covered a distance D2. Now, um, you can, uh, the question that Einstein, Einstein asked was, um, how much time would Bob say passed from when the light bulb turned on and from when it appeared on the screen on the ceiling. Well, he, he would use an equation we all know that the time is equal to the distance divided by the speed. So the bulb time, that's what I'm gonna call it, D1 is uh, D1 divided by the speed of light. Now if you ask Alice the same question, well, Alice time will be D2 divided by the speed of light. Remember, we're using that the speed of light is the same for everyone. But now it's clear that D2 is larger than D1 and therefore, the Alice time will be larger than Bob time. So Alice perceives that more time has passed. Um, this is the special theory of relativity, which is a statement that the laws of physics are the same for any observer moving at constant speed. The thing that we just discussed is called time dilation. The fact that the faster you move, the slower time passes. And this is, this is a real thing. Um, this this, this um, raises the, the following uh, twin paradox, which if you consider two Einsteins, I guess I have too many Einsteins on this slide. Um, <laughs> can never have enough Einsteins. Um, and say you let the, um, the, the, the right Einstein, as in on the right, um, say, say, say you let him sort of move, sort of go far away and come back. While doing that, the Einstein that did not move would have aged more. Let me, let me do that again. So now you focus on the left Einstein. So there you go. Time really runs differently depending on, on your state of motion. Um, and then he would come back and be like, you know, what happened to you? Um, and there are more predictions of, of special relativity. Uh, one is that space and time are really part of the same thing, which we call space time. Second is, or third, uh, the famous energy mass relation E equals mc squared, which says that the energy contained in you is equal to your mass multiplied by the speed of light squared. Okay? And we know that this equation is correct 
uh, because of all the shirts it's printed on. Um, OK. Space time is also the story of gravity. Um, Galileo taught us that all objects fall at the same rate, independent of their mass. Um, you uh, all might have heard the story that you know, Galileo went, uh, climbed the Tower of Pisa, uh, took uh, two uh, different massed uh, objects, and then threw them uh, off, and they, they hit the ground at the same time. Well, while this, if you do this, that this, this is what would happen, but this story never happened. And Galileo never did this. He was smarter than that. Um, he was able to reason for this conclusion purely from thought. Um, so he considered the following thought experiment. He said, let's suppose that heavier objects fall faster. Okay? Then he said, OK, let me consider an elephant and a mouse. The combination of elephant plus mouse is obviously heavier than the elephant by itself or the mouse by itself. Therefore, the combination should fall faster by, by, by this assumption than the elephant by itself or the mouse by itself. But then he said, hang on, there's something weird happening. Shouldn't the mouse slow the elephant down? And so, so you see when you take, so you started with an assumption and then took it to its final logical conclusion, and he found, the, he found what we call a contradiction. Um, uh, therefore, the initial assumption of, heavy, of heavier objects falling faster is incorrect. And rather, everything must fall equally fast. And then there was Newton, um, who made the very, I think it might sound trivial, but I think it's a very deep observation. He said that the Earth applies a force on the apple. And that's what makes the apple fall down. Um, and you might also be familiar with his equation that says that the force is equal to the mass. For example, the force between the apple and the Earth is the mass of the Earth multiplied by the mass of the apple divided by the distance squared times this constant, a Gn, which we call Newton's constant. It is a fundamental constant of nature, an intrinsic property of the universe. Now, Newton's greatest intellectual leap uh, is, is that he he made uh, the, the connection to say that the force which causes the apple to fall is the same one which causes the moon to orbit the Earth. Now, from his time, this was not obvious at all. And uh, it, it really takes a certain kind of mindset uh, to be you know, with everybody else, watching, you know, seeing the same phenomenon uh, or phenomena happening in front of you, but making a connection that nobody else has made. Uh, I guess that's why Newton is Newton. Um, uh, so he, he, the way he showed this is he, he said, if you take an apple and you throw it softly, it'll fall on the ground. But if you throw it really, really fast at just the right, rate, uh, the right speed, here this is a cannon, but yeah, same thing, um, then it's going to orbit the Earth. It's sort of falling towards the Earth, but it's always missing the Earth. That's what's happening. Um, and it's correct to say that the moon is constantly falling towards the Earth. And that's the, same, this, that's the same effect. So you would not be lying if you called your mom and you said, the moon is falling towards the Earth. Um, um, OK, then comes Einstein. Um, now he's a bit older, a lot wiser, um, who said, who declared a principle, the equivalence principle. He said that the laws of physics are the same whether one is on the surface of a planet or accelerating in a rocket in empty space. So, um, so, so here's a rocket that's just stationary on the Earth, kind of a big rocket, I guess. Um, and here it is accelerating in space. If, if this, uh, assuming that the rocket is accelerating at the right acceleration, 9.8 meters per second squared, then when this guy drops the apple, it'll fall. But when this guy also drops the apple, it will also fall. This is something you've all experienced uh, uh, on your way to this lecture. Uh, when the car first accelerates, you feel a force backwards, a uh, force pulling you uh, towards the rear of the car. And um, the insight of Einstein is to say that that effect is actually the same effect as gravity. Um, but, in but in this case, 
you're not, um, the reason why you feel the force of gravity, or, or rather, yeah, the, the statement is that the reason you feel the force of gravity is because uh, you are accelerating through space time. All of us here now, we feel gravity. That's because you're accelerating in space time. Now you might say, but I'm not moving. Yes, you're not accelerating in space. You're accelerating in space time. That's the point. If you jump off a building and you're falling down, you actually ex experience no gravity, even though you might uh, say otherwise. Uh, but you won't actually feel anything. Um, the reason is, uh, in that case, you're, you're accelerating through space. You're falling down. Um, but you're not accelerating through space time. Um, to fully understand the statement, take physics. OK. Um, okay oh, oh, now the next step is, uh, so Einstein took this further. He said it's, it's actually pretty easy, to, pretty easy to, uh, to convince yourself that the following thing will happen. He said if you're accelerating in a rocket and then you shine light, what would happen is that the light would bend. So again, this is something you're, you're experienced with. If you're in a car and you throw an apple or you, or you throw something in the air and the, and the car is accelerating, that thing will hit you in the face or it'll, it'll fall backwards. That's the same effect. The light will also bend in the same way. But now, but via, the, via the equivalence principle to say that this is the same as that, well, that means that gravity must also bend light. And this has been confirmed by an experiment by uh, Sir Eddington, um, very close to a few years, or maybe I think in the 1930s, actually, or 20s, late 20s, um, that showed that, uh, demonstrated that the sun actually uh, bent the light coming, to, coming towards us from a distant star. So this is Einstein's theory of general, general relativity. It's a statement that gravity is caused by the bending and warping of space-time. And the more the mass of an object is, so take here, for example, as, uh, the sun, the more warped space-time is. This is a, a cartoon, this, uh, this sort of mesh. That's a cartoon for the strength of gravity. Um, um, this small planet here orbiting this larger star, let's say, the reason why it goes in a circle around, well, the reason why it orbits in a circle is because of the shape of how space-time is deformed. It's, it's, it's trying to go in a straight line, but it's forced to go around the sun. Um, um, it also predicts gravitational time, time dilation, uh, which is a statement that time passes more slowly in regions of stronger gravity. So here we have uh, our, I guess, twins, uh, twin Einsteins, although one is a lot older than the other because he was tricked. Um, but, but this older Einstein knows about uh, general relativity, while the younger one does not. Uh, he knows that time runs slower near uh, in, a region, in, in the region of stronger gravity, but it runs faster far away. And therefore, what he, what he can do is he, he, he can uh, go towards the Earth, uh, stay there for some time, wait until the farther Einstein gets older, and then he can go back, and now they're even. Okay. Um, next is gravitational waves. That's another prediction, which are... Uh, waves in the fabric of space-time that travel at the speed of light. So here's a simulation of two black holes that are orbiting each other. And uh, this, is, this is a simulation of an actual uh, observation. Uh, these are two small black holes, and you can see the, the waves going away. That's because things are changing. But once they coalesce, there's nothing changing anymore. Um, um, so sort of, you know, if I, if I take the sun and I move it back and forth, back and forth, we would feel a wave coming towards us. Thank you, LIGO. Um, so here's a, here it is again. Um, OK. Um, uh, this was detected by the LIGO experiment in the United States uh, back in 2014. Uh, but they detected many other events since then. And what they used is a, what is called a, a, um, an interferometer. You don't need to know what that thing is precisely. Um, it's, um, it's just a device that can measure the relative size of between two arms. So here, this is what it looks like. You have an arm there and an arm there. 
Uh, it's just too big, it doesn't fit on the picture. Each, each arm here um, is, I don't know if you can read that, it's four kilometers long. And uh, the only thing that's involved here is light that gets reflected off mirrors and so on. You don't need to know the details. But this experiment is crazy um, in, in, this, in, in, in terms of its precision. It can measure relative size uh, changes of 0 0.00, I don't know how many zeros there are here. Uh, I think 10 to the, um, uh, this is 10 to the minus 16. Essentially the size of a proton. It can sense that, that the arm changed uh, by this tiny, 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 tiny amount. And um, I guess I should have said, the reason why the relevant thing here is to measure relative uh, size difference is because uh, when, the gra when the gravitational wave passes, it's a bending of space and time, and so it's a changing of, of the distances that you measure. Um, so, they, so here's an interesting question. Where in the universe did this observed event take place? So this is our solar system. We're roughly 20, 27,000 light years away from the center. So our light, a light year is just a distance that, that light covers in a single year. The size of our galaxy is roughly 200,000 light years, okay? Um, so where, where did this event take place? Well, turns out we need to zoom out. Zoom out a lot. It actually happened two billion light years away, uh, which is 10,000 times the size of our galaxy. Uh, this means that this event happened two billion years in the past. And I think they detected this event, I think one month after they, uh, they turned on uh, the experiment. So somehow two, th two billion years ago, this event happened just for this experiment to turn on uh, uh, the detection uh, or the apparatus in time. Um, so this is crazy, I think. Um, so you might say, if it's really far away, just how big uh, were, these, were these two black holes that were orbiting each other? Um, so here's a black hole. Um, in, uh, now to, to, uh, to um, make you sort of get a sense of how big this black hole is, I need to use an astronomical measure or a ruler that you're familiar with. And thankfully, we have one in Dubai. That's Burj Khalifa. Um, these, uh, this, the diameter of this black hole is roughly four Burj Khalifas. And uh, if you're in Dubai, you take selfies. Here's one, here's one in Dubai. And I'm from Abu Dhabi, so here's one in Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, so these, these, these black holes are pretty tiny, sort of uh, uh, by cosmological scales. Uh, but they're very, very, very heavy. Um, in fact, these black holes are roughly uh, 20 to 30 times the mass of the sun. So imagine taking 20 suns and squashing them to a point. You can't really see that point. So, th so they're very, very, very dense objects. Um, so what are black holes exactly? Um, first off, um, general relativity predicts that if you pack uh, too much matter in a small volume, uh, then you'll form a black hole. Um, this process can, can happen naturally uh, when a star runs out of fuel to, uh, to burn and collapses, into, uh, collapses under its own gravity. So if you have a star somewhere in outer space, uh, there are two forces keeping the star as it is. There is the outwards, outwards force coming from thermonuclear explosions within the star, uh, fusion, um, um, keeping, keeping everything afloat. But you also have gravity, which pulls everything together, giving it its spherical shape. Um, but at some point, it'll run, it'll, it'll run out of fuel. And then what happens is that it just collapses under its own gravity, assuming it's of a certain, a certain size, forming a black hole. And uh, the thing that, gra that uh, general relativity tells us is that gravity, if, 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 um, if you compress something um, uh, enough, gravity overwhelms all other forces and the star just continuously uh, collapses. Um, here's a picture of what the gravitational field of, um, or yeah, the gravitational field of, of a black hole would look like or how it bends space time. It looks something like this. Um, the outer 
region of the, or the outer surface of the black hole is sometimes called the event horizon. So that's, that's this region there. Uh, in, terms, in terms of the uh, space-time picture, or rather the uh, space picture, it's, it's a circle uh, which is the size of the black hole. It's this blue circle. Um, I'm going to ignore using actual, the actual spheres for black holes. I'm only going to talk about how the space-time is, 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 um, is modified by them. So I'm going to ignore that. So here, this circle there, uh, is, the, um, is the event horizon of the black hole. That's the point of no return. That's the point which, if you cross, you cannot come back out. In fact, nothing can come back out, even light. And that's why they're called black holes. Um, so if you're, if you're an observer here, a skater on, uh, on space time, if you, you can go close to this event horizon and then escape. There's no problem. Um, but if you make the mistake of crossing the event horizon, then you're doomed to fall, uh, to, to fall inside towards the singularity, which I'm not going to talk about. Um, and um, um, the only way to escape a black hole is to, travel, is to travel faster than light. And nothing can travel faster than light. That's a cosmological speed limit. Um, in some sense, another uh, vague statement that you have to take physics to understand. In some sense, um, inside the black hole, you cannot even point towards the outside. All directions point towards the inside. Take physics and you'll understand it. Um, let me see. Um, so how do we know that black holes exist? Um, the detection, so one is the, from the detection of the gravitational waves. The other is indirectly through how they affect the motion of stars. Um, for example, if you look at the center of our very own galaxy, you see something strange. So these are, this is an actual video. These are, these are uh, stars that are much bigger than our sun. And if you, if you zoom in, you see that they're, they're going around something. You see that one? But there's nothing there. Um, and by the way, this is, the scale of this video is years, not, not minutes or second, seconds. Um, so they're orbiting something, but there's nothing there. Therefore, the only thing that can be there is a black hole. And in fact, it's a black hole uh, whose mass is 4 million times the mass of our sun. Yeah, this is pretty crazy. Um, all right. So that's all I had about space time. Now let me transition to quantum mechanics. Now uh, I'm going to say a few things uh, that you're not going to understand, or, um, or maybe you will understand, but you won't believe me. Um, OK, now you really need to take physics. Um, so quantum mechanics came about uh, trying to understand the very small. Um, uh, Max Planck and Albert Einstein revolutionized our understanding of light. This light that comes out of the screen um, and so on is actually composed of tiny packets of energy called photons, um, each with energy equal to H, Planck's constant, another fundamental constant of nature, times the frequency of that light. Um, um, yeah, the, and the, word, the, the place where quantum comes from is, is, I, is I guess, quanta packet. Um, and um, yeah, so this is one observation. Uh, this, this happened at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And then there were efforts to try to mesh this with, with a possible theory for how atoms work. And that's the first such model uh, is the Rutherford uh, Bohr model, which says that you should think of an atom, uh, it's, it's really a guess. But, but it's an informed guess. It's really, it's, um, so you should, think, you should think of it as negatively charged electrons going around a positively charged nucleus. And you also come up with a rule. Seems ad hoc, but you come up with a rule and say that the electron can only be in certain circular orbits. There, 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 and they're, they're very fixed, and so on. Um, this comes from a rule that says that the, the electron uh, angular speed or angular momentum must be quantized, uh, i.e., e., comes in uh, integers 
or integer units of, uh, of the Planck constant. But why? Why did that have to be the case? It was a crude model, but it worked well. Um, but also, in some regions, it, it, in some regimes, it did not work. But still, why did it work? Um, a theory that uh, reproduced the correct results of this model was due to uh, Schrodinger and Heisenberg. Oh, wrong Heisenberg. Um, um, uh, so they, they independently um, arrived at the, at the same theory, the theory of quantum mechanics. And, um, and what this theory, well, first of all, this theory gave us a new picture uh, of the atom. So here, here, this is an atom of a single proton and a single electron. Um, and they said that you should not think of the atom as an electron going around a proton, but rather that there's a probability for where the electron could be. And that probability is given by these shaded areas. The brighter the area is, the more likely that you'll find the electron there. And the set of words that you, that you use is that the electron is in a superposition of these locations. It's everywhere at the same time. Let me, let me emphasize this point a bit more. Um, so in classical physics, the old way we used to do physics, we say that a system is uh, described in definite terms. We say that, that an electron is, uh, it has a definite position and speed. It's there and is doing nothing. That's how we usually describe things. My bottle of water is here. Um, but in quantum mechanics, no. Um, the state of the system, or rather the quantum state of the system, is described by a probability distribution, or rather a quantum probability distribution, sometimes, sometimes called a wave function. And um, so, you, so now the electron would be in a superposition of possible places. It could be anywhere in this region, uh, but it's most likely in the center, and that's given by a probability distribution that says that, it, that, 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 that the highest probability is in some region here. I guess this point refers to this point. Okay, so that's what a superposition is. Um, but this is weird. This, this tells you that the theory of nature um, needs to be, or any theory of nature needs to be probabilistic and not de deterministic. Um, in fact, you can have different copies of the exact same system, but, but which would produce different outcomes, different results. I don't know who said this, but apparently it's the definition of insanity uh, to be doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. We're all crazy, I guess. Um, OK. Um, something you can consider is, um, is what I call a quantum coin or a qubit, uh, which is a coin which is in a superposition of being 50% heads or having a 50% chance of being heads and a 50% chance of being tails. We can prepare many such uh, quantum coins in the exact same way. So I have five coins in, in, inside five boxes. And um, as I open these boxes, I will get, I will, let's say open the first one, I'll find heads for say. Uh, open the second one, I'll find tails, tails, heads, tails. Um, I will, I will get heads 50% of the time and tails 50% of the time. Um, and the, the point here is that you, you get different results for the different coins, even though they started with the exact same quantum state. Um, I should emphasize that the first coin was not heads before I removed the lid. It became heads only once I did so. In quantum mechanics, the mere act of observation changes the state of the system. That's what's happening here. Um, then there is quantum entanglement. Uh, you can consider two entangled quantum coins. I have a coin here inside the blue box and a coin inside the red box, and they're entangled. What does it mean for them to be entangled? Well, if you open the first one and you found heads, then when you open the second one, you'll also find heads. Right? So um, let me actually go back. There's a 50% chance when you open the first one that you would find heads. So you do that and you found heads. But then there's a 100% there's a chance that the second one 
will also be heads. And similarly, if you open the first one and you found tails, then you know for, for certain that the second one will also be tails. And something weird about this is that this is true um, independent of the distance between these two quantum coins. You can have one in Abu Dhabi and one in New York. And the, the, the results of these measurements will be the same. Um, this is kind of weird, um, uh, so much so that Albert Einstein uh, called this uh, spooky action at, at a distance. And in fact, it was him who, who um, him and two others, P Podolsky and Rosen, who uh, wrote the paper talking or introducing the concept of quantum entanglement. And funny thing is that he wrote that paper trying to disprove quantum mechanics, showing that it's wrong. That's his most cited paper, um, but, but used as evidence for quantum mechanics. Um, okay, so that was quantum mechanics. Now, the next step is to unify these two great theories, and which goes under the name uh, quantum gravity. Um, spoiler alert, we don't know how to do that yet. Um, but various attempts um, have led to many, many surprises. Um, and the strategy, one strategy, is to consider the most sort of confusing, confusing situation in which both theories play a central role and uh, where they sort of don't, don't really want to work together. And it's in that regime that you might actually be able to make progress. Um, a, the a pioneer in this field is Stephen Hawking, who said, um, um, how would quantum mechanics change our picture of black holes? Well, first off, he, he noted that in classical physics, so without quantum mechanics, the vacuum is the vacuum. Empty space is truly empty. There is nothing there. Um, but if you include quantum mechanics, there are actually uh, quantum fluctuations. Uh, particles can appear and disappear uh, in the vacuum. So blue and red particle appears from nothing, and then they annihilate, going back to nothing. Um, um, you might think that this is a theoretical abstract thing, but actually has, uh, uh, has been checked experimentally. Um, so what Hawking did is uh, he said, let me apply that in the case of, of a black hole. So if I have a black hole space-time, something like this, I, I, I'm, I'll have these fluctuations um, uh, happening outside, uh, outside the black hole or inside the black hole. But sometimes uh, this, uh, this process will happen right at the black hole horizon. And when it happens there, uh, the, the red particle uh, just flies away from the black hole. By particle, think of it, think of it as light, uh, as a photon or something. It's, it, it'll travel away from the black hole while the blue particle will fall inwards. It's a funny thing in these calculations that the, um, the red particle actually has positive energy. It carries energy away from the black hole while the blue particle falls in and has negative energy and reduces the energy of the black hole. Um, and so uh, the result is that black holes emit heat. And this process is called, uh, or this radiation coming out, is called Hawking radiation. Um, and so the picture that you find is that if you have a black hole and it's uh, uh, evaporating in this process, using this process, um, after some time, you'll just end up with just flat space. There's no black hole anymore. But you have radiation streaming away from where the black hole was. That's this picture. Um, so it looks fine so far, except that um, Hawking found a problem in, in, the, in, this, in this discussion. He found that the state of the Hawking radiation is always the same, no matter what you throw in it. Moreover, that, that it's always random. It's the same random state no matter what you throw in. For example, you can have two black holes. You throw in one of them the uh, English dictionary, and you throw in the other the Arabic dictionary but the resulting radiation coming out of these black holes will look identical. So this means that the information that fell uh, into the black hole is lost forever. This is the famous information paradox 
of Stephen Hawking. Um, now, from, from other results, from other uh, angles, we know that this conclusion just cannot be correct. It cannot be the final story. And this conflicts with basic principles of quantum mechanics and results in string theory and so on, which you can ask me about later. Um, and this is where I come in. Um, with, 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 with a few of my collaborators back uh, uh, in Santa Barbara, uh, with Jamie Sully, a, a fellow graduate student, my advisor, Joseph Polchinski, and another professor in Santa Barbara, Don Morolf. I guess that's me. Um, um, we, uh, we took various statements in the community or that were believed to be true in the community about black holes, and we showed that they were inconsistent. Um, the first is that, the, there's that black hole evaporation should not lose information. So the information paradox must be resolved somehow. We don't know how, but it needs to be resolved somehow. Um, second, that an infalling observer sees nothing unusual at the horizon, as in you, you fall in, you pass the horizon, nothing, nothing goes wrong. But, it, but uh, it's a different story what happens when you fall deeper and deeper. I, I won't talk about the singularity, as I said. Um, the third statement is that the physics outside the black hole is, um, is not modified. So we understand um, uh, pretty much what goes on outside black holes. And the thing that we pointed out, uh, but also pointed out by others uh, as well, that the source of the information loss is that the Hawking, part the, the Hawking partners, this red and blue particles or photons uh, that appear from the vacuum, uh, appear, appear entangled. As soon as they're created, they're entangled. They're, they're in an entangled state like the quantum coins that I, that I discussed. And therefore, the only way to resolve the paradox is that this entanglement must be broken. Um, now, it turns out that this entanglement is actually necessary uh, for stitching together the very fabric of space-time at the horizon. And therefore, if you break this entanglement, you necessarily break up space-time along this circle. And we propose that what happens when this uh, entanglement is broken is that the interior ceases to exist. In fact, what happens is that the black hole interior is, is shielded by a firewall, um, something that, um, that, if, that any falling observer uh, would encounter and just be burnt to a crisp. Um, so that's, that's the famous uh, now firewall paradox. Um, but moving on, this idea, oh, I should say that this so far does not have, um, sort of it's not resolved yet. And if you ask me to bet, I would say firewalls don't exist, even though, even though I'm an author. Um, um, but that's progress, I guess. Um, and um, this idea that entanglement creates space-time is an interesting one and really has been a hot topic in recent years. So here are, the, here are some of the names working on, on, this, on this idea. Uh, Mark Van Ramsdonk at, uh, in Canada at UBC and Lenny Susskind at Stanford and Juan Maldacena at the IS where I work. Um, uh, what, what, what they're trying to do and many others is to, is, to, is to try to find rules for how space-time emerges from entanglement. And here's a, um, so for instance, we can consider the following situation. Um, say you have a bunch of quantum coins. So here, uh, entangled quantum coins. So this blue coin is entangled with the first red coin, uh, or the coin inside the blue box is entangled with the one in the red box, and so on and so forth. Say you take each set of coins and you collapse them into a black hole. What you'll end up with is a pair of highly entangled black holes. Um, I drew a picture for what the space-time looks like for each black hole. Remember this tube that sort of went down? But the question is, what is the space-time interpretation of all this entanglement between the black holes? And it turns out that, that uh, what you get is a wormhole connecting uh, the two black holes. Um, yeah, and so this, it's, this, uh, I should say this, that this is sort of cutting edge. Um, um, 
all the i's have not been dotted and so on. Um, um, but if you take this, if you take this idea to its logical conclusion, then you would necessarily say that any single entangled quantum coin also has a quantum wormhole, something that we don't really understand very well. Um, this is not a smiley face, by the way. Um, um, if this is true, I think this actually addresses Einstein's worry. Uh, that, he's, that he, he was worried that entanglement is weird because it looked like um, um, action at a distance. But it's not really at a distance anymore. So even though these coins might be far away in sort of the ambient space, but they're connected by a very short wormhole. Um, and so, yeah, he might say interesting or whatever interesting is in German. Um, so that's really all I had to say. Um, and um, I think it's a really exciting time in physics, in theoretical physics at least. And um, the, the place that we find ourselves in is really reminiscent of the uh, early days in the 20th century, uh, trying to understand quantum mechanics and having crude models that, um, that seem to work sometimes and not work in others. Um, and, um, but given the sharpness of the questions and, uh, and the corresponding paradoxes, there really is a sense pervading the community that we're really on the, on the verge of a breakthrough, or that might depend on the conference you're at. Um, uh, but nevertheless, I think there's still, a lot, there's still a lot of progress to be made and more and more surprises uh, to uncover. Thank you.